Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Curie Shen's webinar with Avidity Biosciences. Today, we will be talking about their trial, Explorer 44TM, a clinical trial investigating the potential for AOC 1044 to treat individuals with DMD mutations amenable to exon 44 skipping. So we're very excited to have the team here to talk to you today um, and to answer your questions at the end. This webinar is being recorded. Um, we'll send it out for a view after to all registrants, and it will be available on the Cure Duchenne website soon. Um, by the end, you know, of the webinar, we're going to do a live Q&A, but I do, you know, suggest you use the Q&A tool at the bottom of your screen as questions come to you throughout the, the webinar so we don't, you know, forget to answer them at the end. We'll have them in the queue and we'll address them all around the last 15 minutes of the webinar, so please do utilize that. And then if you have any additional inquiries or a question pops into your head tomorrow or you wanted to get in touch with our team or the team at Avidity, please email cares at curedushen.org and we'll make sure to address that. And before we get started, of course, I needed to mention um, the Curedushen Futures 2023 National Conference. Our registration is open, open. We have tons of families signing up and we're so excited to see everyone at the end of April. Um, April 21st through 23rd, we're going to have a three-day, very informative conference uh, with a lot of things that are fun for the families and especially the kids. So um, we would love for you to visit our website, curedushen.org slash futures, all sorts of information on there and how to register. And now I'm excited to welcome Kelly DiTrapini and um, Mark Stahl from Avidity Biosciences. Thank you so much, Carrie. Hi, and good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today. And thank you to the Cure de Chen team for inviting us to share about Avidity and our progress in developing a potential treatment for the Duchenne community. We're excited to share with you information on our recently announced clinical trial, which we are calling Explore 44. The trial is designed to investigate the potential for our investigational medicine, AOC 1044, to treat individuals with Duchenne mutations amenable to exon 44 skipping. On the next slide, you'll see that we will be making forward-looking statements during today's presentation. And next, I'm going to go through a quick overview of our agenda. Today, I will share an overview about Avidity, our technology, and our approach to patient-centric drug development. And Mark, who you can see here on the screen, um, will discuss our program for AOC 1044 and share more information about the Explore 44 clinical trial and its design. On the next slide, it's a little bit about me. I'm Kelly DiTrapani, and I'm going to be talking to you today um, about our approach to patient-centric drug development. I am the Vice President of Medical Affairs at Avidity, and I am a nurse by background and worked in pediatric rare diseases. On the next slide, I'm gonna talk a little bit about our mission. And Avidity is a biotechnology company based in San Diego, California. So beautiful, sunny San Diego, Southern California. At Avidity, patients are at the heart of everything that we do. Our mission is to improve the lives of people affected by diseases that have limited therapeutic options, such as Duchenne muscular dystrophy, by advancing a new kind of drug class. Our team has extensive experience in drug development, and that combined with our commitment to involving people like you, the communities we serve, patients and their families, at every step of the drug development process, is really the foundation of what drives our company forward to advance treatments in rare muscle diseases, including Duchenne. On the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about our overview and where we are in advancing potential treatments for DMD. Our innovative drug technology is designed to unlock a new way to deliver drugs directly to affected cells like muscle and heart cells and allows us to develop treatments for diseases with currently limited therapeutic options. We are applying our technology to develop new treatments for DMD, which have the potential to address the underlying cause of the disease. And Mark will get into this a little bit more later. We strive to really continue to partner with the Duchenne community to incorporate the patient voice and your voice into everything that we do. We are initiating the Explore 44 clinical trial 
with our first program for DMD with AOC 1044, as I mentioned. And Mark, as I said, will share additional information about the preclinical research we have conducted to date that will help support bringing AOC 1044 into clinical trials very soon. Our technology offers a new approach to exon skipping. Our potential treatments are called antibody oligonucleotide conjugates, which is a really big tongue twister. So we call them AOCs for short. AOCs can be designed to target muscles. And we are first developing AOCs with the goal to treat the genetic cause of muscle diseases, including DMD. The building blocks of AOCs are, the platform, are where we start with our platform, which combines two proven technologies of existing drug types that are actually pretty well understood for each of their specific properties in drug development. We utilize antibodies, um, and as you all are very familiar, an antibody is a naturally occurring protein made by your body that helps fight infections. And antibodies are actually commonly used in drug development because they can be made to target almost any protein, including those that are different between one cell type and another. They're well characterized in drug development for safety and are the foundation of over 100 approved drug therapies, which are for chronic conditions. At Avidity, we're using the antibody as a vehicle to deliver our drugs to muscles and heart cells. Oligos are short strands of DNA or RNA. So that's the oligonucleotide part of the AOC. They can be powerful drugs because they can change gene expression or how the body makes a protein by targeting RNA. There are currently multiple approved oligo drugs, many of which are disease modifying treatments. And Avidity, we're using the oligos in our AOCs to tailor and create it specifically to target the root cause of diseases. So the antibody delivers the oligo to the muscle and heart cells. For muscle diseases, the antibody component of the AOC enables us to take this targeted approach to deliver the oligo to the muscle and heart cells and in turn, improve the power of the oligo. The antibody has the unique ability to recognize and stick to that specific protein on muscle and heart cells, delivering more oligos and allowing them to change gene expression. For our AOCs in development for DMD, the antibody binds to a transporter protein called transferrin receptor 1 or TFR1 in the muscle cell to modify gene expression by targeting the RNA. You can think of the antibody as a bus that's taking its passengers to a very specific bus stop and letting them get off and go to work where they need to. And that case, in this specific instance, the bus stop is a muscle or a heart cell. I love that analogy and I've stolen it from someone in my company. So it helps me picture it really nicely. Um, as you can see here, we have a pipeline of drugs for rare muscle diseases. So by combining these two drug components, the antibody and the oligo, and utilizing them in our AOCs, we are working on developing a number of products um, for different rare muscle diseases, including we ha having mu multiple programs for DMD. And our first program that's entering the clinic is for the Duchenne um, muscular dystrophy population that is amenable to exon 44 skipping. So patient-centric drug development really is something that is important to us at Avidity and something that we strive to keep at the center of everything we do. We seek input and partnership from multiple key stakeholders in the development of new treatments. And we believe that it is only through active ongoing partnership across these stakeholders, including patient advocacy organizations like Here to Shen, the community of families they support, healthcare providers, health authorities like the FDA, and coverage and insurance providers, that true patient-centric drug development can be achieved. These collaborations can help ensure that patients and their families are put first in the decisions and our shared effort of advancing new and meaningful treatment options. We are continuously seeking input from the Duchenne community throughout each stage of our development process to best address your needs. Collaborating early and often will always be the key component of our process. And we are doing this through listening, partnering, and connecting with families in the community. Patient and caregiver perspectives inform our approach 
to drug development and inspire us as we stay committed to our mission to improve the lives of people impacted by diseases like Duchenne. We design our clinical trials in partnership with patients and their families to ensure we are meeting their needs and expectations. And finally, we want you to feel heard and supported and know that you have an open line of communication to our team. Avidity is committed to partnering with the DMD community to bring forth these meaningful treatment options. Our commitment is rooted in our mission statement and we believe in involving families, as I said, at every step of the way. On this slide, I wanted to share some important examples of how your voice has already directly impacted our programs for Duchenne. Through partnerships with organizations like Cure Duchenne, we are grateful to connect with you in forums like today's webinar, as well as to support important resources and initiatives that um, these groups bring to the community. We are also investing in gaining a deep understanding of the journey of living with and caring for someone with Duchenne. Through conversations with you, we have gained important insights into the experiences and challenges and your personal journeys to a diagnosis and establishing your care team and management plan. We have also brought together a focus group of caregivers and patients from the Duchenne community to inform the design and services that we provide in the Explore 44 trial. Finally, we're collaborating with community leaders in an ongoing way with the goal of addressing gaps in support services and resources available to you. Thank you for partnering with us as we advance towards our shared goal of bringing new therapies to the Duchenne community. And with that, I'm gonna hand over to Mark who will go through much more information on the AOC um, 1044 and Explore 44 clinical trial design. I think what you guys have all been waiting for. Over to you, Mark. All right, well, thanks, Kelly. That was really fantastic. Um, hello to everyone. My name is Mark Stahl and I'm a neurologist and scientist working on developing new medicines here at Avidity Biosciences. Go to the next slide. So Avidity is developing multiple exon skipping AOC drugs and Kelly gave a really great introduction to to what those are and I'll expand on that a little bit uh, and we'll, we'll talk uh, more about exactly what exon skipping is and what that means momentarily. Our first program for the treatment of Duchenne is called AOC 1044 or 1044, and it is designed to treat individuals whose mutations are amenable to exon 44 skipping treatments. We are now advancing the AOC 1044 program into a phase one, two clinical trial, which of course I will talk about in a little while. We expect to learn from the development of AOC 1044 and apply that knowledge to other programs that are currently in the research stage. So on the next slide, I'll go into the science of why these exon skipping treatments depend on an individual's uh, DMD mutation. So Kelly mentioned the oligo, the oligonucleotide. Uh, and I'd like to talk to you a little bit about what the work is that the oligo actually does in the muscle, uh, as, as we've uh, called it, exon skipping. So many of you I know are probably familiar with this idea because there are already some drugs that do this, but we can review what exactly exon skipping is and hopefully this will help to uh, make sense of why certain uh, people may be able to uh, get certain drugs and some people may not. The sentence that we have here, that the mad cat ate the fat rat and the big bat, is a metaphor for exon skipping. You might remember way back from uh, college or even high school uh, that the genetic code is a triplet code. That is, it's made up of a series of three chemical letters that tell a cell what part of a protein or what individual amino acid to add to the growing chain that is eventually a full-length protein like dystrophin. When part of a gene is deleted, the deletion can cut off whole words, like in the first example. This is called an in-frame mutation because the remaining words aren't changed from the sentence. This leads to a sentence that's missing some words but can still make sense, or a gene message that makes a shorter but still usable dystrophin. This kind of deletion happens in dystrophin naturally and is actually what is seen in Becker mus mus muscular dystrophy. That second sentence in blue is what happens when a deletion cuts off part of a word. Because the genetic code always works on three letters, parts of words get kind of smooshed together and you end up with garbled nonsense. When this happens to a gene, the cell will literally delete the message that the gene makes. And that's why people with Duchenne make almost no usable dystrophin protein at all. The last sentence in purple is what happens 
with exon skipping. An oligo can force the cell to skip over reading part of a gene and give you a message that is shorter, so maybe not perfect, but is still readable. In terms of what that means for Duchenne, you're now able to make this shorter dystrophin protein where before you had almost none. As you might also be able to see, skipping a, a specific part of the sentence only gives you a readable outcome for very particular deletions. That is why exon skipping depends on a person's specific mutation. So exon 51, exon 44, and so on. That's why we talk about being amenable to skipping. Okay, so that's, that's the science lesson. And I hope that makes sense for, for why we're talking about uh, skipping certain exons in, in uh, these exon skipping treatments. We can go to the next slide. So let's talk a little bit about how what we are doing is different from the exon skipping you might already be familiar with. As many of you know, exon skipping is a technique that's used by four currently approved drugs, but those drugs are not targeted to the muscle like AOCs are with our antibody. So without the targeted delivery that the antibody provides, oligos have inefficient uptake by muscle and heart cells, so they don't make all that much dystrophin and they require frequent dosing. Let me go to the next slide. Kelly very nicely introduced this already, but let's re review the idea of what our drug can do for, for Duchenne. Remember that AOCs combine antibodies that target muscle and heart cells with the exon skipping oligos. In this diagram, you can see the AOC on the, on the left. The antibody part of the AOC binds the, spe the specific protein on muscle and heart cells to deliver the oligo to those specific cells. Once delivered, the oligo enters the cell to modify gene expression by targeting the RNA message that eventually makes the protein in the type of exon skipping that we just discussed. By combining the oligo and the antibody, we are able to more efficiently deliver oligo directly to muscle and heart cells. More oligo means more skipping, which means more dystrophin. Let me show you a little bit of data from our labs. The next slide. Here, we can see a little bit about the expected effects of our AOCs based on preclinical or laboratory experiments over the next uh, few images I'll show. In this first experiment, <clears throat> we tested just the exon skipping ability of our oligo that skips exon 44 in muscle cells that are taken from DMD patients, showing that it works well when cells are exposed to it directly. This is a nice demonstration of the fact that more uh, oligo into the cells means more exon skipping. So this nice dose, dose effect and a nice uh, amount of exon skipping that depends on how much oligo we get into those cells. In the next slide, uh, we are, we are uh, able to compare what happens when that highly effective oligo is given alone. So here, as, an, as, as uh, in this slide, it's written unconjugated oligo, so an oligo just by itself, versus when it's connected to an antibody in a mouse model of DMD. Here you can see uh, that with, with the oligo alone in an animal, on this graph, the amount of skipping is actually hard to see. It's around 1%. But when we use the exact same amount of the exact same oligo, except this time connected to an antibody to make an AOC, having the antibody portion of the drug increases skipping by about 50 times over the oligo alone. This is a result we find to be very exciting. If we go to the next slide, uh, we, we looked at uh, what that skipping means for the important task of actually making dystrophin protein. So again, we compared single doses of the same amount of oligo with the antibody in green and without the antibody in blue. On the left side, uh, you can see graphs that show exon skipping, so how many skipped copies of the, of the uh, RNA we made. And then on the right, you can see the amount of dystrophin that we make uh, with just a single dose. We see an increase from about one to three percent of normal dystrophin uh, levels of uh, normal uh, levels of dystrophin protein without an, uh, the antibody attached to the oligo to 20 maybe 30 percent in skeletal muscles and maybe a bit less in heart and remember these are just single doses in a mouse we may expect to see accumulation of dystrophin with multiple doses if we go to the next slide kind of the last of these laboratory experiments i'll show you today you can visually see both that the amount and the distribution of dystrophin made with AOC treatments is very close to that that we see in the normal mouse on the, on the far left-hand side, that far left picture. It says wild type. The distribution of dystrophin protein evenly throughout the muscle may be important for muscle function and is really quite nice with the targeted nature of the AOC. So instead of relying on a 
on an unconjugated or naked oligo to, to diffuse from the blood into the tissue, uh, we have a targeted delivery um, where, where we can get a, an even amount of oligo into most of those muscle cells. Okay, we can go on to the next slide. Um, maybe enough with the, uh, with, with the science lessons that teach us a little bit about what we might expect to see uh, and, and really raise our excitement uh, for what, what might happen uh, in, in people. Um, today, I'm also going to get to show you a little bit about uh, what our first experiment, uh, uh, the first uh, fruits of our experiments in, in, uh, in cells and in animals have brought us to the point where we can actually bring this drug uh, into the clinic. Go to the next slide for us. I'm gonna tell you today about the Explore 44 study. This study was designed in partnership with patients, caregivers, advocates, and key physicians in the field to ensure we are best meeting the needs of the Duchenne community. The study starts with part A, which evaluates single ascending doses of AOC1044 compared to placebo in approximately 40 healthy volunteers who are adults. Then part B is planned to enroll 24 participants with DMD between the ages of seven and 27 years, regardless of ambulatory status. So both ambulatory and non-ambulatory uh, patients can enroll. Part B will evaluate multiple doses of AOC 1044 compared to placebo administered by an IV infusion dosed every six weeks. The primary goal of Explore 44 is to evaluate the safety and tolerability of AOC 1044. and will also include tests of dystrophin production as measured by muscle biopsy, muscle function, and patient reported outcomes like how people are functioning in their daily activities and abilities, so forth, and quality of life in participants who have uh, Duchenne. You can go to the next slide for me. So this is a diagram of the study design. In the darker bars on the left, you can see part A of Explore 44, where, I, where as I mentioned, 40 healthy volunteers received single doses of AOC 1044 or placebo uh, via in IV infusion. And then on the right, in the lighter color, in part B, the teal bars show the 24 participants with DMD44 receiving three total doses of either, either AOC 1044 or placebo. Every six weeks, they receive a dose via IV. In Explore 44, three quarters of the participants will receive AOC 1044 and one quarter will receive placebo. The plan is to offer all Part B participants the opportunity to then continue in a follow-up extension trial where everyone, including those who start on placebo, then receive AOC 1044 every six weeks for a longer period of time. This two-part design of Explore 44 uh, enables us to efficiently test safety and tolerability with all the associated blood draws, EKGs, and so on in healthy volunteers while minimizing the burden on participants who have DMD by not giving them doses that we anticipate to be less than the amount needed to provide a therapeutic benefit. Overall, we think this is the fastest, safest, and most considerate way we can bring the therapy eventually to patients. You can go to the next slide. Um, of course, in discussing how we would uh, deliver uh, this trial to, to people, we wanted to make sure that the patient experience was as positive as, an, as it can be. And so in partnership with the Duchenne community, we, we, did, we incorporated multiple features to enhance the, the trial itself, the experience of the trial. Some of these ways include uh, the use of home health visits. So some of the uh, select study visits occur via home health check-ins to reduce travel and how many times people have to visit the clinics. Uh, we have a travel uh, concierge that arranges and pays uh, uh, ahead of time for airfare, lodging, ground transportation, all of those kinds of uh, logistical things that can be a, a, you know, a difficult part of uh, participating in a clinical trial. And then, of course, uh, reimbursement for uh, trial-related expenses. All of, this, all of this with the idea that we want to make uh, participating in our trial uh, as positive an experience as it can be for, for everyone who uh, agrees to, to work with us. A few points in summary. First, of course, we are extremely excited by the potential of Avidity's AOCs to treat the underlying cause of DMD in muscle and heart, as we sh showed in some of our preclinical experiments. Uh, we've shown robust exon skipping, restoration of dystrophin protein, and then improvement in muscle function in mouse models of DMD. With our IND application now cleared for AOC 1044, 
we're initiating our first Duchenne clinical trial called Explore 44 using AOC 1044 in patients with dystrophin mutations amenable to exon 44 skipping. And that is by the end of this year. We're planning for intravenous IV in, in, uh, infusion dosing every six weeks in our study. And we expect that what we learn from our lead program, the, the Explore 44 study and AOC 1044, will then help to inform and streamline our programs for other exon skipping drugs. Finally, as, as Kelly discussed, we're partnering with the Duchenne patient, patient advocacy organizations to get you more information and resources as they become uh, available to us. And then finally, one of my personal favorite slides, I think there's one more uh, uh, in, the, in the deck. Um, some of the Avidity team members who are working hard every day to have brought uh, our, our drug into a clinical trial. We're an extremely passionate group. We love the work that we do. And we really genuinely consider it our privilege to serve this amazing community of patients and caregivers, advocates, and so on. We're always looking to connect to you and hear from you. So please do feel free to reach out to us with any questions at the email address that's here on the bottom of the screen, patients at aviditybio.com. And thank you all so much for your attention. Mark and Kelly, uh, this is Mike. Thank you so much. I truly appreciate that update on the program. More than happy to provide. And can we just Very start with a, a couple of questions? I think that the, the community would want a little bit of granularity around. Can you give some sense of the number of centers that you'll be recruiting and their locations? I, I can talk about that a little bit. Of course, um, we are uh, starting with with uh, with a single site, which is for healthy volunteers only, and that's a, a very a single, very specific site that has some uh, particular requirements uh, that 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 go along with it. Uh, after that, uh, we'll be moving into uh, you know clinical sites that are uh, primarily uh, located around uh, the United States. Uh, and our initial plans will be also to include sites in Canada and then possibly uh, outside of the United States uh, as well. Uh, the final number and the uh, exact uh, uh, identities of those sites has not been decided yet. So we are still working very uh, diligently to get uh, the um, participation uh, of, of which sites uh, will be working with us, um, you know, kind of all, all lined up and, and set up uh, as we speak. Excellent. Thank you, Mark. It seems like a work in progress. Um, could you add a little bit more color into the extension phase of Part B? It, it seems to me that, that that there certainly is going to inform an awful lot more information for the company about the long-term consequences and perhaps even the dosing frequency that might be optimal in here. Right. So the as you might have, have gathered, the initial study, which uh, you know only has a, a few doses uh, associated with it, is primarily to establish clearly um, as much as we can about the safety and tolerability, and then you know the optimal um, uh, dosing frequency and um, and dose amount uh, for the for the ongoing parts of the of the study uh, going forward. Um, if eventually, we plan to use that information from this uh, this initial uh, part of the of, of the study that we just uh, discussed today, Explore Forty Four, um, to to make decisions about exactly how the structure of uh, that, that second follow-on study uh, uh, will, will work. And so that, this initial study will inform um, things like the uh, dose that we choose to go forward and, the, uh, and uh, potentially the dosing frequency that we use uh, going forward as well. Um, and that study, of course, is, as, as it's a bit in the future for us, uh, has not been finalized in terms of its design. So there's only uh, so much that I can tell you. But eventually, that study also will uh, involve the both um, functional, uh, you know, outcomes in terms of, of you know, uh, muscle movements and things like, uh, you know, the uh, North Star assessment and, and pull testing, like in the upper extremities. Uh, but then also, of course, uh, we'll be looking at uh, levels of dystrophin in that study uh, as well. Um, and so that, that, that's kind of the very high level uh, outline uh, that we kind of have available uh, now. But uh, as we kind of go forward and we learn more uh, from, from this uh, first study that we're initiating, we'll, we'll of course have some more details that we'll be able to share in the future. 
No, that's fantastic. Thank you. I think there's a real acknowledgement from the community, and I see it actually manifest on a couple of questions about taking a broader age range of patients. You know, quite often we find that the older, particularly non-ambulant patients are a secondary consideration in here. You know, so I think it's real credit to the company, you know, taking that broad age range initially and looking for benefits with this type of approach. Well done. Thank you. We, yeah. we absolutely did take that. Uh, that was something that we heard uh, quite a bit from the community. And uh, we wanted to do everything that we could to, you know, establish, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of prerequisites that we would need to be able to treat a, a broader, um, you know, uh, range of, of, of patients. And so uh, we really had to incorporate uh, that idea, you know, early on. And we, but, but it was a big priority for us to be able to, to include a wide age range. And so we, we did that from the, you know, nearly the, the beginning of the program. Um, and, and I think it's particularly, it's important, I think, in all uh, Duchenne studies, but, but particularly for the uh, Exxon 44 amenable population, uh, some of whom, you know, do have um, a little bit uh, slower uh, disease progression and a little bit longer uh, prolonged time to, um, you know, changes in their ambulation state and things like that. And we wanted to make sure that we were able to capture all of that, um, you know, in this particular uh, group of, of patients who, uh, who we're looking to uh, treat first. Yeah, actually, actually, you know, I'll broaden the statement. I think the consideration that you've given into travel and home visits and trying to make this as easy as possible, uh, particularly for older patients, you know, is we, we actually acknowledge that. And I think it's it's tremendous to see that their sort of insight into the company at an early stage of clinical development. So another another check mark for well done. Thank you. Yeah, I, you know, it does help to... Um, you know, have a lot of people who have either been, you know, touched by rare diseases themselves or, you know, uh, folks like, like me who, uh, you know, treated uh, folks with, with Duchenne and, and some other neuromuscular diseases to kind of, you know, get, get a little bit of that, uh, you know, background into the study. But, but, but really, at the end of the day, it's been all about uh, our engagement with the community and, and hearing what, what they have to say and what, and what their experience has been, you know, so far with, with other trials and what they would like to to have a, you know, an, a trial experience to, to be like. And we've tried, you know, our very best to really incorporate as much of that advice as we could. Yeah, excellent, thank you. Um, I, I'm, I'm really pleased to see 44 advance. It's one of those axons that has been overlooked on a number of occasions. Can you say a little bit about the inclusion exclusion criteria? You know, now that we've, patients have got options out there and they may be on alternative meds or even in gene therapy, you know, is that, how's the company looking at that? Yeah, so in, in addition to, you know, uh, relatively broad age range, uh, you know, for, for the inclusion, we also try very, tried very hard to have a very broad inclusion um, in, in other ways as well. Um, so, you know, that will also include, you know, other, uh, other medications that people are on. Of course, um, we do, uh, we do uh, take into consideration, you know, whether people are on steroids, but uh, p people who are on steroids or not are both uh, able to, to be in the study. Um, I will say though, you know, you brought up gene therapy specifically. Um, unfortunately, we would not be able to include people who have already had gene therapy uh, in, our, in our study. Um, there's a few reasons for that, but one of the biggest ones is that, of course, we expect and hope that uh, gene therapy will produce dystrophin. That's of course the goal. Um, and of course, one of the main things that we will be studying in our, in our uh, trial is how well our drug produces dystrophin. And, and of course, that, that would kind of confuse things a little bit too much for us to be able to, to really get a good handle on what our drug was doing uh, by itself. So, so, so no, no gene therapy, um, but uh, a, a you know, broad range of sort of the usual uh, treatments that, that uh, Duchenne patients may be taking are, are allowable. Um, and, and you know, of course, um, you know, in, encouraged uh, if, that, if they're needed for the, for the patient to be doing well. Yeah. Mark, can I ask specifically about Vimorgon? You know, it's a question that I get all the time. You know, there's a number of patients that are on that, yet it's still not an approved therapy. Um, how does the company view that as an inclusion exclusion criteria? Right. So um, I, that's a that's a great uh, question. And and really, you know, as far as we are concerned, uh, you know, Vimorgon is essentially is a corticosteroid. So that that falls under the same um, you know considerations that we have with. For uh, for other uh, steroid treatments, whether they're, they're you know prednisone or, or deflazacort, uh, you know th uh, that would that would more alone would fall into that same uh, category. So we um, we really don't have a, a you know uh, an exclusion criteria, but we do request that people uh, be on 
consistent uh, doses that don't, you know, that, that are not anticipated to change for a certain period of time um, leading into and, and through the trial. Um, so, but that's, that's about it, uh, you know, a pretty, a pretty um, relaxed, um, you know, a sense of that. And, and, and again, that, that goes towards this initial trial being, um, you know, very much about learning the, about the uh, safety of our treatment as well as you know, getting a good um, sense of what will be needed in terms of a regimen, so dose and frequency, uh, for the for the longer trial, um, with with dystrophin being uh, dystrophin levels being our, our primary um, you know sort of uh, interest initially, and sort of the functional outcomes being uh, less critical for 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 this trial. Going forward, um, for perhaps uh, you know a phase three in the future. There may be some some more uh, requirements around steroids just because of their their significant effects on on function. But because they they don't affect dystrophin levels directly so much, um, we can have a pretty broad uh, and relaxed um, inclusion uh, around both, uh, or, or I guess I should say all. <laughs> now that there are three um, uh, uh, corticosteroid type uh, treatments. No, that's super, and I appreciate it. I, I know that uh, other. Other trials can be a little more stricter, depending upon the type of outcomes they're looking at. But it really puts a lot of pressure on certain individuals to switch steroids mid midstream. So this actually will help tremendously with patients. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, could you? Get, I, I'm looking at a few of the questions, and one in particular popped up in my mind was just speaking a little bit about biopsies, the type mm -hmm. of biopsies, the number of biopsies, or even the you know the time frame between them for what you're looking for. Right, so that's a great question, and I think it's you know it's very um, it's very important to you know be upfront and 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 clear about what you know what we plan. And so um, you know this uh, you know it, it's unfortunately uh, a fact uh, of of uh, just the the science behind how this works that we don't have a great way of measuring dystrophin levels um, without doing muscle biopsies, and that's uh, that's just um, that's just the state of the art uh, as things are right now. Um, and so because, especially in, in these initial phases, you know, the best way for us to measure that our, you know, that our drug is, is having, a, you know, the effect that we're expecting to see is to look at dystrophin levels. Um, that, that is what we, uh, we, we do plan to do. Um, and so um, we will be doing, um, you know, an, an open, so for this trial, we'll be doing an open biopsy at the, at the beginning, so during the screening phase, uh, to get a baseline. And then we'll do another one um, uh, at uh, at uh, the end of this study, which is uh, which is week uh, 16. And so those are there are basically you know the, a beginning a biopsy and an end biopsy. Um, and then you know although as I mentioned uh, before that uh, follow on part of the study, the the open label part where everyone can can go in has not been finalized. Uh, the expectation is that there actually will be another biopsy at the end of that as well. Um, and we may be able to spare some people who have um, who've had um, you know a treatment uh, in the initial study. Uh, so in other words, we're not on placebo. Uh, one of those uh, middle biopsies uh, that has you know we haven't finalized our plans, but I think people should be prepared for the idea that that there there can be a you know a final biopsy at the end of about a year of a full year of treatment or so thereabouts. Again, not finalized. So these are. This is, you know, kind of just to, to give people an idea, but there, there will be, um, you know, a, a final uh, biopsy at the once people have have been through um, the initial this initial study and the uh, follow on uh, part of the study um, to to get to to really understand exactly what what it is that that the drug is doing, you know, both over time and then you know, kind of ultimately uh, in terms of how much dystrophin we expect to to be able to make, and so so I think that you know. We're very, we are very sensitive to, you know, um, uh, the fact that biopsies can be uncomfortable and are, you know, of course, a, a very significant, um, you know, and, and invasive uh, test. But unfortunately, at this point in time, there really is no better way to, to understand what, what our uh, drug is doing. And, and so, um, so that will be part of it. Yeah, thank you for that. I, I have to say you actually anticipated my follow on question. And I was wanting to get into that a little bit. But one other thing I would add out there, and I, I, I don't need an answer, but it's certainly something that we will think about. Um, for some of the older non-ambulant patients, you know, taking biopsies is a little bit more risky and also a little bit less informative, you know, given the nature of the muscle that they have. 
And so that's something that's a further consideration in there, particularly as you get into that third biopsy for those individuals. Yeah, that's right. And, and I, I do want to say that one, um, one thing that we probably will um, be looking for, you know, uh, again, the, the, these, all of these things are not entirely final, but, but uh, is that, uh, you know, an, an, uh, the muscle biopsies will be uh, in the upper extremity. So there, need, there will need to be, uh, in the opinion of the investigator, you know, sufficient uh, muscle in that upper extremity, uh, such that a biopsy will be, uh, mm -hmm. is expected to be informative. That, yeah. that will be an important part of, of getting, of having uh, entry into the study. But with that said, um, you know, we, we would, because it's an upper extremity uh, biopsy, um, we would expect that that would still um, be, you know, a, a possible, uh, you know, thing for, for most of the, even the non-ambulatory patients to be able to, to provide. I totally agree. Uh, thank you for that. And thank you for being thoughtful about it. You know, I, I think not just we obviously understand it, but patients themselves understand the critical nature of giving biopsies for this, uh, this type of approach and really thinking about it in the context of how invasive it is and how much that, how big that ask is, particularly in older patients. You know, we, we do know. And, 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 and yeah, it's, it's not done lightly. I, I assure you. I yeah. totally agree. And that's why I was glad we could touch on it because I want the community to actually know that there's a, a ton of consideration and conversation that's gone in around this here. And it's, it's an ongoing one. It absolutely uh, is. And, and I do want to point out that, you know, um, we, we, we will be looking at, the data as we as we get it as much as we possibly can and with one of the considerations will of course be do we have enough information at any point along the way that we don't have to do biopsies anymore right so that that is one of the questions that we'll be asking ourselves you know as as we're able to get some data uh, one of our priorities will be will there be any a point that we'll be able to say uh, maybe to regulatory agencies hey we think we have enough information to to tell us you know what what our drug is doing in terms of, of distribution production. We we do we do we really need to get any more biopsies? And that will be a, a continuous question that we ask ourselves and that we ask regulators along the way, um, mm -hmm. because it's a priority for us to to limit you know that as much as as much as we can while still getting you know the the scientifically right answer to make sure that everyone's participation is you know goes towards you know the 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 ultimate answer to the questions of that the study is trying to answer. Yeah, so thank you. Uh, thank you for being really thoughtful about that. It, it, it's certainly one of the biggest concerns that patients have, you know, as they decide to participate on one hand. And I think for me, you know, looking at the technology that drives this exon skipping is incredibly exciting. And the early clinical results really speak to that. And I think that's what's caught imagination here of parents and patients who want to participate in this type of study, particularly on exon 44, where we don't have many opportunities around there. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm going to like almost wrap this up. And I know we're right on time, but a couple of easy questions. Uh, one of them was, I, I seen that uh, someone ask about Exxon 53, I believe. And I imagine the company's got all sorts of plans to expand once you've got visibility into the activity of how these are behaving on the earlier Exxons. Uh, is, is that, I, I don't want to answer the question for you, Mark, but I presume it's something like that. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. Um, you know, we mentioned up front, you know, a few of the projects that we have uh, ongoing uh, in the on the preclinical side, you know, on the research side. But the truth is that, you know, we have not um, entirely, uh, you know, uh, decided on which exons or when or what order or, you know, all of that kind of thing. Those, those things are a little bit in the future for us. This, as, as people who might be uh, familiar with, with Avidity may know, um, you know, we're not a we're not a huge company, <laughs> and and we are making some of these decisions, you know, in real time, and some will depend on exactly what, you know, what uh, kind of the, the the data that we start to see from from this initial study uh, tell us. So, um, you know, I, I would not say that we have entirely, uh, you know, finalized our decisions about which exons will go into in what order in what time. But I will say that, um, you know, we are very committed to the to the Duchenne community, and that. This we do have every intention of this being the first of you know of a series of mm -hmm. treatments that we that we develop, um, and so um, you know I I really can't speak to uh, the you know the order or you know identity of any of the other uh, projects really in too much detail, but yes we you know our our minds are open to you know to to uh, applying what we learn here 
um, you know, to, to many, many uh, exons to, to make, you know, our treatments available to as many people as possible if, if it works as well as we think it will. Okay, excellent. Um, one final thing. There's, there's a question that just went off the screen. It was one that was there earlier. Um, one of the parents, Andrew Wilkinson, has a, a daughter, a manifesting daughter, you know, who's lost an exon 42, 43. And the answer to Andrew is, yes, an exon skipping drug targeting 44, you know, would clearly help reframe that. And those patients that are that have lost 42 through 44 are a known Becker phenotype. And so the question really is one, and it's 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 always a delicate one. There's no yes or no, and I'll pose it, but is there a future clinical trial where one would imagine being able to treat those few rare manifesting females out there who could benefit from these types of approaches? What a fantastic question. I, I love that question. And, and I think as, as many probably uh, know, know as well or better than, than most, uh, you know, the, the question of, of uh, manifesting uh, uh, female carriers of, of Duchenne uh, has really been getting a lot more attention lately. And in fact, it was um, uh, the, the subject of, of, uh, of, you know, a couple of really interesting uh, scientific papers and, and some, some recent uh, seminars and things like that, that that took place, you know, in the, um, in the scientific uh, community. And, and, and so it's, it really is a question that's really risen, I think, to the top of people's minds uh, mm -hmm. quite a bit. And, and so, um, you know, I will say that um, our initial studies will focus on, on males. They are, they are all being uh, conducted in boys. So there's no getting around that, that fact. That, that's, that's how we've designed the, the initial studies, mostly to give us, um, you know, the clearest answers that we can get in a, in a scientific study. But uh, absolutely, um, you know, once we've gone past some of these initial uh, studies, I, I think that, um, you know, it is incredibly important for, for us and for all of the other, uh, you know, um, both like scientists, clinicians, and, you know, companies working in this space uh, to, to uh, broaden our, our scope of, of treatment and start to consider how we might uh, best include some of the, you know, the, the sort of, um, I would say, folks who, who get, uh, you know, are pushed out to the side a little uh, in terms of attention. Uh, and, and, and of course, female manifesting carriers are, are absolutely, you know, part of that group and, and thinking about how we might best address, um, their needs is, is very much top of mind. And, and so I think, um, you know, I, I can't, I can't say exactly what the, the plan might be, but I will say that, that, that is not far from, from our, our, uh, consciousness now. And we are, you know, always, uh, you know, keeping that kind of thing in mind and, 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 you know, um, Going forward, that hopefully we'll we'll have something uh, that that will uh, address the needs of, of of female carriers as well. Yeah, thank you for that. I, I, I've met a few over the last number of years, you know, and they they have been excluded from trials. And I think the more that we start to understand the benefit risk ratio of these drugs, the more that we can open it up to uh, at, at the, the female population. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, one final one for me, Mark, is timing of both the initiation of the healthy volunteer study as well as recruitment into the the, the, the study proper for Duchenne individuals. Well, that's a great question. <laughs> um, Kelly, what, uh, what, what can we say about that today? Yeah. So, I mean, what I would say is that we have announced that we are starting this, the trials very soon. Um, as we indicated and Mark nicely outlined, the healthy patient volunteer starts first um, portion of the study. And we have to gather the information and anal analyze that um, before we can start um, going in directly into the patient population. Um, so it will be sometime in the next year that the patient population will start enrolling. And what we look forward to is being able to share information with you as we gather that information and can let you know. At that time, we'll also be able to answer questions about sites and where, you know, if they're somewhere close to you or not. And as you have questions and things, as Mark flashed up on that last slide, we have an email address specifically for patients, so patients at aviditybio.com. And we're happy to answer any follow-up questions and things. And we intend to partner with Cure Duchen to give you guys updates as soon as we can. That's super. I really appreciate that. And I didn't want to ignore you. It's not that there wasn't any questions, Kelly. I just wanted to say I will steal the bus, pop, the bus stop analogy and let you know about it. It works, right? I think it works. It's better to me than a Trojan horse, which is what uh, I'd heard before. 
Well, thank you for that. Um, with that, I want to thank the pair because I like I I've enjoyed the conversation, but I think more than that, it's really exciting to see forty four targeting and that's this is so close to actually opening up patient recruitment. And I wish you the absolute best with that. And with that, I'm going to hand it back to Kerry. Wonderful. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Mark. Um, and really, thanks to the whole Avidity team. You guys have been a pleasure to work with. Um, and thanks so much to the parents and caregivers and individuals with Duchenne who joined today's call. Um, and I just wanted to reiterate that the Cure Duchenne team um, is always here. Please do reach out to us at cares at curedushen.org. Um, we can help assist you with you know, numerous different um, topics, whether it's clinical trial related, whether it's related to any other thing going on into your life, just call us, we're here. Um, and of course, again, if you did have questions kind of pop into your mind over the next few days, reach out to us or reach out to the email that Kelly just um, gave to you and we will work to get your questions answered. But again, thanks so much for the time today and that concludes this webinar.